So welcome, festival attendees. We're gonna learn a little bit about goats and what these goats have to do with climate. And just for starters, I'll say we keep them. They're part of the Adama farm. We grow organic veggies. We help people learn about themselves and Judaism and sustainability and food justice and climate change and everything else here is part of the Adama Farm, the Adama Fellowship. You can check us out online. And why do we keep goats? Well, they're really versatile. They, they're very, um, they're not so picky about what they eat. So right now they're eating hay because it's winter time, but most of the season we have a lot of kind of weedier, brushier, old abandoned pat farm pasture, and they'll eat poison ivy, and they eat multiflora rose, and they eat Asian bittersweet, and all the nasty invasives that often we're trying to get rid of, they will eat. So, and they'll eat on this pasture back here, we'll move them around, do intensive rotational grazing, and we keep them here for food production and for companionship, and honestly, to learn about Judaism. Though not all of these goats are Jewish. I just want to be clear about that. They identify in different ways. But seriously, our ancestors were shepherds. Outside the barnyard here, we have a, a, a quote from, from the book of Exodus about our ancestors, the shepherds, and what does it mean to be a shepherd and how our ideas of leadership and our ideas of spiritual leadership and what it means to be a community are really influenced by our time as shepherds in the Near East a few thousand years ago. So what we have here today at the Adama farm, these are all female goats. These are all does. The buck uh, we brought in for a couple months to breed them, to impregnate them, all except the smallest who's here is too small um, to Miss Laura's was too small, she's not ready for pregnancy. And the rest of them, we hope, God willing, are pregnant. And they're starting to kind of look like that. You have a five month gestation period. And then God willing, God is willing, we have kids born here, goat kids. And they're super fun and they jump around and they nurse from their mothers. And then um, eventually they start eating solid food and they go on to pasture and, and we start milking the mom. Sometimes we start milking them earlier, sometimes later. We make goat cheese. We, for six years, ran a commercial goat dairy here. We're not doing that now. This is homestead educational style. Guests come and watch us milk. We teach goat milking classes and it helps feed the community here. And then the boys, who are born here end up out on pasture eating the on all the edges of our land eating much of the otherwise unwanted agricultural residue and the brushy stuff and then we do a single and i'm sorry to talk about this right here in front of the moms but this is the cycle of life agriculturally we do a single educational shechting kosher ritual jewish slaughter here in the fall to produce meat for the consumption of the community. And then we also take the skins and what I'm holding here is a uh, pretty much finished piece of cloth or parchment, right? This is the Torah and the little cloth, the little parchment inside mezuzahs on the doorposts of some Jewish homes and our actual most sacred text is written on animal skin. That's what a real piece of parchment is, a kosher Torah is all animal skin. Could be cow, could be goat, could be sheep, could even be deer skin. And, um, and that's what we made from this. This is the, the leftover bits of it. And we cut out squares here to make parchment that our holy text can go on, that can go in mezuzahs in a, um, on, on someone's doorpost. So I'm really happy to take questions. This is supposed to be a fun session. So we can remember, we can get out of our heads a little bit and get outside and um, spend a little time with the goats and remember what it was like to be shepherds, remember what it was like to be people whose lives were very much about tending 
to flocks of animals who then gave us food. One of the theories about the land of milk and honey is it was a land of milk actually because it was very, the land of Israel compared to Egypt where we were coming from or Mesopotamia was hilly, dry lands with a lot of brush. And when we said it's a land of milk and honey, what we meant by that is a lot of good place for goats and sheep to eat, the brushy stuff that they like, and a lot of nice wild plants to for the bees to pollinate and make honey. So I'm happy to take questions at this point. I don't know if we have questions yet. We yeah. do, we do, we have questions. Um, Shamu, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how many goats we chef each year and a little bit more about the process? Sure. So it depends honestly on how many boys are born. Sometimes we buy in some male sheep as well. Uh, so we generally do eight or 10 animals, eight or 10 small animals. And at what age are you shechting the And goat? they are shechting then they're born around Passover. So imagine Passover to November, I could get someone to do the numbers for me, but I think that's something like <laughs> seven months, eight months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's right. Thank you. We had, um, and I'll just say another question. reason that time of year, obviously, that's when you know uh, it's getting to be winter here, and grass and bushes, vegetation stops growing very quickly. Our days are much shorter, and so it makes sense rather than having to spend a lot of energy feeding them through the winter at the end of that season, shafting them. Great. Thanks. Um, next question is. Um, so I'm going to try and go through these questions quickly, but um, how did how did we get involved with having goats at Isabella Friedman? And is it true that they only eat young poison oak? <laughs> um, we're, so we're East Coasters, so I don't know about poison oak, but they have plenty of eat, they eat plenty of poison ivy here. We don't have poison oak, um, and we got involved because uh, we started this farm here at Adama, and at the time, my parents also had goats on their farm. And it felt like a, the right animal and the right scale for us goats rather than cows. We don't have, you can see this is also hilly, brushy land. We don't have a lot of pasture for cows or even a single cow, but we can keep a lot of goats fed um, in this place. And it's also, there are human scale. We can pick them up, we can move them around. We don't have massive equipment or livestock trailers. And I should just say that goat, right? Many people, many farmers in the world, uh, in most parts of the world, are poor subsistence farmers. And goat is the most common meat eaten because most of those folks in sub Saharan, actually all over Africa and large parts of Asia and large parts of South America, they raise goats because uh, they're so flexible what they eat. They don't demand a lot of water, and they're pretty tough and they're easy for humans to, to move around to shepherd. And is there a particular breed of goats that we have or how does Great that question. work and why, we, we why have, a specific breed? Yeah, we, we haven't gone with a particular breed. There was a time where we were, we had more sonins and we've been doing this now for 18 years. So we've had many breeds and these are all mixes. All, they're a mix of lots of different breeds. Um, because we'll bring in a different buck, a different father, a different stud every year. And then depending on who we can find, um, that, you know, determines at least part of the breed. So all these goats are here. Let's come in here so we can see them. Can you see them now? And while you're, while you're showing us around their space, can you talk to us about when they're in the goat, the barnyard and when they're on pasture and what that yeah, looks like? Yeah, totally. So like they take yeah, us through the their day. <laughs> yeah, the pasturing season the pasturing season ends in November and it'll start again in May. And so some much of the rest of that time they're in here, although they can be taken for walks around. And we I try to bring them some some uh, they got a bunch of Christmas trees. They're like eating those, and we try to bring them some other brush here. But this is winter time is, is time to be in here eating dried grass, right? Otherwise known as hay. This is dry grass and this is what they eat. You might see one of them, the goat in the back there is chewing her cud. And um, 
you know, this grass is fibrous stuff. Some, if we weren't goats, you'd think of it as low quality food. You have to chew it several times, right? So they chew it, goes down into one of their stomachs, gets regurgitated back up, and then they chew it a second time, right? It's really fiber stuff, takes the work of a lot of the bacteria that we live in symbiosis with, they live in symbiosis with to digest this stuff. The other part of the year, they're getting, they're on pasture, getting moved around, the females down here, the boys up around the veggie farm on BB Hill Road and their day uh, during milking season, let's say May through November, would start with milking at, um, at a little after seven o'clock. They would come in, they get to eat some organic grain, which is corn and oats and peas and soybeans while they're being milked. And then they go out to pasture for the day and we move pasture once a week or if it's a big plot once every two weeks to get them on fresh grass and then they get rotated back to that same pasture they were on a few weeks later well no a few yeah seven eight weeks later once the grass has regrown they're pooping out there which helps to fertilize the place and all the collection of poop here will go to um will go to the compost yard and get turned, get mixed with leaves and chicken poop and food scraps to feed our so to feed the soil. That's the compost that feeds the soil. Evan Masu Aboni Maitala Roshbina, right? The stone that the builders rejected will become the cornerstone. It's about compost, about the things that we reject and how that makes the cornerstone of food. That's how we feed ourselves through that nutrient cycling. Um, can you take us around and introduce us to all of the goats and specifically tell us their names? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> this here, right here, is oh, and they're blue. Ages. If you can, you see her? Yeah. Yeah. This is blue. This is the first time she was bred. This year, this is Ness and Miss Laura mother and daughter. Miss Laura was just born. She's not even a year old. She's a little bit skittish. Mm. And that's Ness. This black and white girl is called Colby. Looking like she's pregnant here. And these two in the back who are kind of skittish just came to us recently. They came from some kind of rescue situation. So they're a little bit still skittish and not that comfortable. One of them is more comfortable with me than the other. And honestly, we haven't named them yet. We've started the process. You'll notice these goats have beautiful, beautiful horns. On the rest of the female goats, we remove their horns when they're a week or two old, which hurts, but it only hurts for a few minutes because we found that when we left the horns, we ended up um, they ended up sometimes hurting each other. Like we ended up with cuts along their sides when they were fighting. And it's really, really hard to keep a deep goat cut, um, cut on the side of a goat clean in the barnyard. So that's when we started removing their horns um, right after they were born. But again, these two white ones came from another farm. And we had a kind of contest about their name and we got suggestions, but honestly, I don't remember right now who won. We'll figure that out. We'll figure it out this winter, this spring. Great. Um, we have some questions. We have a question about regener regenerative farming. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that topic and growing animals for sequestering carbon? That comes from Ellen. Yeah, it's a great question. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of conversation about animal agriculture. Obviously, we need to reduce the amount of meat that we're eating and reduce the amount of animal agriculture. The key thing about the way we do the goats in a regenerative sense is that we do them, we're rotating them on marginal lands, on steep lands that we couldn't grow vegetables on. People say, well, wouldn't it be better to grow vegetables on that? And you couldn't actually grow vegetables on any of the pastures where these goats are eating. Um, and all their waste ends up um, adding to the soil. And we minimize the amount of grain that we feed them. They only get grain towards the end of pregnancy and when they're being milked. And we buy organic grain that's grown locally. Um, 
and that's a, a big issue too with a lot of organic even the organic grain that's being grown is being grown in china uh, romania brazil nothing wrong with that organic grain it's just uh carted around the world and you can imagine imagine the costs climate costs of of shipping so the main way is just by feeding these goats things that are essentially um, invasive weeds that we're trying to control and the byproducts of agriculture, the byproducts of, of farming rather than feeding them mostly grain. Intensive rotational grazing, if done properly, has been known to increase the amount of carbon in the soil. As long as your timing is good and you don't have too many animals on a plot of land. This is a very small operation. This is all our goats. Um, so this is, you know, this is, this is a small educational farm. It's not an example of, of large scale agriculture here. Thank you. Um, can you talk, uh, how, how long do goats generally live? What's their lifespan? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the goats can live often up until, you know, eight, 10, 12 years. We've had goats last that long. And we've also retired goats. We just sent one of our goats and she was nine or 10 years old, Zola. She just went to become a companion to a lonely horse. <laughs> Someone needed a companion for their horse. Zola social grew up here around a lot of people. And so she won't be milked. She can't, she shouldn't be bred anymore. That might be dangerous for her because she could have complications during kidding. So we retired her from this herd. Yeah, nine, 10 years in. So goats can live longer, but they shouldn't be bred mm -hmm. after a certain age. And you can judge that by general health. And we also use, we use vets. Mm -hmm. And our, our vet helps to, you know, make recommendations in terms of the animal health. Lots more to talk about in terms of regenerative, ag regenerative agriculture that has more to do with the veggies and fruits that we're growing on the farm, but I won't get into that today. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Wendy. How much space for grazing do does a goat need? That's a great question. I don't have a specific number. I would have to look that up. Um, and goats are social animals. So we never talk about one goat because <laughs> one goat alone wouldn't work. They would not, they would be really, really miserable. They are a herd animal, they're a social animal. So um, you can have many goats on a single acre of land, but remember in the winter, you're gonna be supplementing their feed with, with hay. In not that long from now, in six weeks or so, we'll start doing pruning on our fruit tree and bushes fruit trees and bushes and those prunings will bring here. So we also, they'll eat all that stuff very happily. So supplement their, their pasture in a lot of different ways. So some of it depends on, are they just on pasture or are you supplementing their feed in other ways? Um, we have a question from Sunny and it is, is it okay to get a goat and then there's a goat emoji as a pet? And maybe we can talk about our pygmy goats and show them those cuties. It's true, yeah. We'll go and see how <laughs> Good Tell us about our pygmy goats. Thanks, Sonny. So we do have some goats here. Goats are notorious for getting out, so we got to be careful about the gate. And honestly, that's the biggest work with goats is fencing. So. Our guests really wanted to be able to take the goats out and come and visit the goats whenever. And often they're out on pasture and the behind electric fence. So if you're here with young kids, that might be kind of tough to do. So from our neighbor, we were gifted. Ah. Not faking it. It's actually hard to open this gate. This is real farming live here. These two goats we got as strictly as pets, meaning they're not being bred, they're not being milked, they're just hanging out. And they're very, very friendly. They're pygmy goats. They're a breed of goat that doesn't get larger than this. And um, the male is castrated and 
they, yeah, they're just here. People, guests to Isabella Friedman can come and literally take them on a walk. They will follow you. We have leashes for them. They are pets and you can walk them around the lake here and they'll nibble on things and then come back to the barnyard. Here they are, pet goats. I, will, I always say about the pygmy goats is that you say, you know, you can take them for a walk, but really they take you for a walk. That is so true. So. Yeah, well said. <laughs> they, do. they can pull very, very hard. You wouldn't think because they're small, but yeah. they're very strong. Yeah. Someone's asking about, are they Nigerian dwarf goats? Yes. Oh, yep. good. Nice. Yeah, we had some questions pigmy. earlier about some <laughs> other breeds of goats, but um, I think I lost the question. So if anyone has other questions about these pygmy goats specifically or anything else, feel free to keep putting your questions in the chat. This is all really great. Um, I wonder, is there a way to show the milking parlor and talk about that process? Oh, sure, good idea. Also, Toby wants to hear some stories about their personalities. Do you have any insight on their Goats are known for, yeah, having personalities, <laughs> not like sheep. Um, meaning they're cantankerous and very, very curious. And they'll test every friend and they're social and they'll come up and say hi. And during the season, they would, during milking season, starting again in May, they would come in through this little door here and come right here. We'd take some grain and put it in this container and hang it right here. And then stick their head in there and we would milk them. We would grab a clean milking pail that looks like this um, and milk into it. We would sanitize their teats, uh, weigh the milk, uh, do a lot of washing up. And here in the clean room, we'd pour the milk through a filter. Well, because sometimes you get schmutz in there, the most common form of schmutz is some goat hair that you don't want in your milk. And then we took, take the milk um, to the refrigerator. So that's what we do in here. We also trim their hooves. Their hooves need to be trimmed and give them medication and do other things like that. Yes, in the milking parlor. Believe it or not, there was a time here many years ago where we had, we would milk 15 to 18 goats a day oh. and, and make cheese and drive it to New York City. And some folks, uh, if you've been around this Jewish food movement, and Kazan and Bella Friedman for that long will remember how good our goat cheese was. True. Um, one more question about are the are the baby goats allowed to nurse until they're weaned? Or do they yeah. um, they yep. nurse until they're weaned? Thanks, Irene. Um, I mean, yes, they nurse until they're weaned. Yep. I mean, once they're eating a lot of solid food, you know, six weeks in or so. We, we will put them on pasture, but they're mostly weaned at that point. And weaning also depends on the mother and the child and the conditions of food and the herd and all that. So, oh, look at Ness and, and uh, Miss Laura, so cute next to each other. That's mother and daughter if you came late. Um, the strong resemblance. All right. Uh, let's see, we have some new messages or questions, excuse me. We've had a lot of these questions. I've had about four requests to find out if we rent our goats out for invasive uh, brush and we do not. Um, we don't, we don't, it's a great thing. There's other companies that do, we're just not set up for it with trucks and trailers and, and fencing. But I know there are people who do that. Got it. Um, 
Ellen had a follow-up question. She said, your cheese was amazing, definitely. And she said, um, you said the word medicine when we were looking through the milking parlor. Do you mean conventional medicine or do you mean herbs and homeopathy that you give to uh, I mean, both, both conventional and herbs. Mm -hmm. Yep, both. And do you know if the goats rest on Shabbat? It's a great question. <laughs> All, the goats do rest on Shabbat. They just have different versions of rest, right? Different <laughs> definitions. They're, they're really self-actualized and we believe in an evolving Judaism, but yes, they do rest. I mean, they look pretty restful right now. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, have you, have we do you... milk them on Shabbat. People ask that question, oh, good we question. Milk them on Shabbat, but we don't, we don't use that milk or we give that milk to neighbors. We didn't use that milk to make cheese. When we ran a dairy, we gave it to neighbors. We don't want to waste it. Um, and this is a community in general that celebrates Shabbat in lots of different ways. Um, do you have a favorite goat? <laughs> do I have a favorite goat? I don't know. I mean, I really, you know, Ness is a really, really sweet goat. Colby is a great goat. She's a little on the odd side, but I really do like Colby. Does anyone, anyone in the crowd see, it's not so, it's not so easy to recognize anymore, but does anyone see um, with our goat names, a um, common theme? Can you, can you give those names again? We have blue. blue Colby. Colby. And blue. <laughs> I mean, it's a little interrupted by Ness. Got it. Or, They're cheesy. We got cheese it. it. That's right. That's right. We did have a cheese theme. We've had that strong For a while. Day. In the we past. had Zola, who you said before is uh, moved for the lonely for the lonely horse, and she was short for Gorgonzola. Very cute. Yep. Um, Shamu, can you talk a little bit about how long you've been at uh, Isabella Friedman in Falls Village at Adama? Um, yeah, well, I've been here. Um, the cameraman today, who you who you can't see, <laughs> is my oldest child, and we've been here since he was very young, which means we've been here 18 years this time. And I also taught for Teva in the mid nineties. So, so it, it's been a long time. That's 235 years in Isabella Friedman years. <laughs> it's like kind of dog years and goat years. Um, but yeah, be thank I feel very thankful to be a part of this community and, and teaching and farming here for a long time. And just so everyone out there knows, um, I linked Hazon's website in the chat in the beginning, um, but also Adama Farm and Fellowship um, has moved to some virtual programming for the time being. It's called Adama at Home and it's open to everybody. So I would definitely, I'll post the info in the chat, but you should um, check it out on the Hazon website as well. Um, and, um, oh, okay. Yeah, there's some more questions about acreage and someone says their ears are cute. Um, what, what is the minimum amount or minimal amount of acreage someone needs for four to five goats, let's say? Um, that's a great question. You know, I, I don't, I don't like to answer those questions simply because none of them are simple. You'd have to see the acreage, what's growing there, what's around it, what climate are you in? Um, so, I mean, there's people who have four or five goats on half an acre and they just buy in a lot of hay right <laughs> or they bring in a lot of brush and then there's folks who have 10 acres for four or five goats and just rotate pasture so again there's just so many ways of doing it i think that's one thing to understand about regenerative agriculture oops i didn't close the gate um Just to say regenerative agriculture also means that the agriculture is adapted to a particular piece of land, right? We're not just, it, yeah, agriculture needs to be adapted to a particular piece of land and particular life cycles of the place, right? Um, so, so much of that depends on getting a good fit and designing your agriculture system for wherever you are. 
Um, someone's asking about heat in the barn. Can you talk about how the goats, you know, how they, they do they cuddle? Are they warm? Yeah. What do they do in the winter yeah. together? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it uh, we don't heat a barn and goats don't need a heated barn. Uh, we do draw here. Let's walk outside. I'll show you this. Everyone now, I'm sorry, everyone's getting distracted by the topsy turvy bus behind you. Uh. <laughs> So maybe at the end we'll talk about what that is, but uh, we'll focus on goats at the moment. I don't think they they have heated water either. No, uh, no, no. They drink cold water. So if you right. see this, uh, we are she we your servants or shepherds, as were our fathers. Genesis forty seven three, right? A little bit of our our history there. We bring these blankets down just to block the wind out a little bit, makes it more comfortable for them. But it's, you know, it's an open, mostly open barn, three-sided structure. It's really three-sided just with some canvas on the fourth side. And they're warm in there. They are mammals. They, you know, they generate a lot of heat. And we use a deep bedding system. So we add hay, bedding hay to the floor. Um, and then they, yeah, they cozy up. What they really need, they need to be out of rain and wind and snow. They need shelter from those things. They wouldn't be good if they, they, they need a way to be sheltered from rain and wind and snow. But otherwise, yeah, they, they stay warm. It's not a problem. And when the young are born, they're really cuddling up to their mom. Sometimes we do use a heat lamp for the first few days or week if they're born on a you know, really cold, cold time. Um, of the year, but generally we time our births around Passover so that by the time they're ready to eat solid food, voila, there's spring and there's new growth around for them to eat just when they're weaning from the mother's milk. And that works well for the season. Great. Um, Carol wants to know what the daily schedule is like with goats. Do you ever have a day off? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> um, if if you're milking, you never get a day off because once you commit to doing milking, you it would be a very uncomfortable for them or dangerous for them not to milk them. So once you start milking, you're milking through the season, and then if you once you're once you're slowing down the milking, you have to move slowly. We we milk once a day. Commercial dairies they milk twice a day, um, but then you need to slowly taper them off so they get used to the new cycle. So um, no, you don't get a day off from milking uh, and there's daily chores with all the animals to refill their water and to bring them hay and to clean out the area in the barn a little to remove poop and to lay down some more bedding hay so it's more comfortable for them. So we're doing, we have some uh, Adama alumni who are here with us and they're helping us with, with winter chores. And generally we'd have the Adama Fellowship here, a residential two or three month fellowship for Jewish 20, not just Jewish, but mostly Jewish, 20 somethings and 30 somethings here exploring Judaism and ecology and climate change and community and identity and social justice and farming. Awesome, we have a lot of people just saying that it's good to see you and the goats, lots of fun memories about milking. Uh, making, I can't pronounce the cap, cap, cappuccino. <laughs> um, uh, someone asked a question about at Isabella Friedman, you know how many people live and work there? Um, I'd say on, on in busy season, you know, pre, pre and hopefully post COVID somewhere between 25 and 30 people are, are, are working and there are, I don't know, 10 people living um, residentially, uh, that was for Toby. Um, question about sort of um, vegan environmentalists. Um, how do how how do you address kind of this ethical dilemma uh, from the from the context of a vegan environmentalist? Well, you know, really, some of my best friends are vegan environmentalists. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. But it's true. It actually is true. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I think I have a lot of respect for people who make, I mean, all of us need to make serious commitments, sacrifices to comfort in our lives for other people and for the rest of the world, right? 
we all need to make commitments and those commitments are often a stretch for us. So I have a lot of uh, you know, respect for everyone who can figure out a way to take up less space in the world, to make space in the world for the more than human life and just for other people. So, and I don't think there's a you know, one size fits all solution. I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't know if that answers the question enough, but uh, I think everyone's at a different place with what they eat and what they should eat and how often they eat uh, meat or dairy or if they eat meat and dairy at all. I think all those solutions are great and we, everyone should be moving to less meat and less dairy. Everyone should be moving away from industrial meat and dairy. Um, and do I think there's a place for farms that have small herds of goats or sheep or cows in certain situations? Yeah, for sure. Um, someone's just talking about how, you know, there there's a lot, Irene's mentioning that there's so many alternatives that when she stopped eating dairy, she didn't find it to be a sacrifice. That's true. There's a lot of alternatives out there. So now, many especially. alternatives. It's so true. Yeah. And we, we use the goats to really what we're trying to do is to, we're not by having goats and by doing the shechting and the milking is not saying, look, you should eat meat and dairy. We're actually showing people and giving people an experience of, well, look what it's like to be intimately involved in the life of another creature. Look what it's like to be in a shepherd. Look what it's, look at the work that goes into creating milk and cheese. See what it's like. We also, you know, it's, we have laying hens, we have chickens what it's like to shacked a chicken, to ritually slaughter a chicken and prepare it and eat it. We've created a lot of, of vegans and we've created a lot of people who eat a lot less meat by doing educational slaughter demonstrations. It's about giving people an experience of things that they've only known theoretically, right? I'm fundamentally, I'm, a, I'm an experiential educator. I want to give people experiences that help them understand their place on the planet and their place in community better. And that's, that's why we have goats and chickens. Besides, uh, you know, they fit into the farm and they serve this really important educational role. And we also find that it's just good to have contact with creatures who are not humans, right? That's good for us. And we should be doing that, you know, with the chickadees around us and with the pine trees and the oak trees and the sugar maples whose sap is about to start to flow. And we can also do that with goats and chickens, right? And we can do it with the lactobacilli when we pickle. So it's good, good to be in community with, with more than human life. Great, thanks. Um, someone asked, have, we, have you ever, or have we ever had Angora goats at Isabella Friedman? I don't we know. We haven't had that. Angora goats, no. That we haven't. We've had Sonnens, we've had Toggenbergs, we've had um, Nubians, Alpines. Someone asked about Nubians earlier, actually. Very droopy ear, that's from the Nubians. The two white goats that came here recently look, I guess they look like alpines. I'm not a huge breed person. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of a generalist when it comes to that stuff. Someone's asking about if we ever incorporate our animals into any of the spiritual and rituals that we do or spiritual programming that we do at Isabella Friedman. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, the goat's favorite time of year is the Shavuot parade or their least favorite time of the year because they don't <laughs> like big crowds of people. But we do a first fruits parade for the holiday of Shavuot in the early summer when thousands of years ago, we were all Jewish farmers and we were, we were p taking a pilgrimage with our, our first fruits to the temple in Jerusalem. We do that here with a beautiful song, dance, ritual parade. Um, and, so, and that we've done here for the last very many years. And um, let's see, goats, we have done um, 
the Adama, Adamonics made a great film called Azazel, and we have used the goats for various, whoa, a little head butting there, um, for various rituals involving, um, I guess you'd call it chuva and, uh, and the high holidays when the, a goat is sent off to Azalzel, unclear what exactly or where that is. So we've done things like that as well. And then kidding and weaning, uh, we've done rituals for weaning, for moving your boys up to the new pasture. And of course, around shechting and eating, there are a lot of rituals. And I think it really changes someone's experience of gratitude, of saying a blessing, what it means to say a blessing over food when they have themselves put their sweat into the meal. And yes, that counts for eating tomatoes or eating an apple. And it also counts even yeah, in, in really intense ways for shechting a chicken and you know, and pulling the feathers off and gutting it and cleaning it and cooking it. Or a goat. Thank you. Thanks for everyone's um, positive feedback in the chat. Everyone's really enjoying your session, Shamu. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks um, to the goats. <clears throat> we still Thanks have Thanks to about the goats and all the Adamonics you know, 450 Adama alumni who've cared for these goats and barnyard managers and apprentice over the last 18 years who have really cared for these goats and built these buildings and built the fences and, and spent time milking and cheese making and slaughtering and trimming hooves. That's, this is a, a whole community of folks who have maintained this Adama herd. Huh. We have folks saying that they wish that they could just come and pet and hug them. Totally agree. <laughs> They're very sweet. And is there a way to tell how the goat, if the goats are pregnant without, you know, medical help, or is it just based on their size? Have you ever thought a goat was pregnant and then wasn't and vice versa? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I think pretty much anything you can imagine <laughs> that could happen has happened here. Um, we, um, it's, it is hard to tell because when you eat grass and, you know, plants like that for a living, you get a pretty big belly that's doing a lot of fermenting of various kinds. And in the winter, you've got a thick winter coat covering that. So it's hard to tell from just looking at them. Although, it will be easier to tell in March by then when they really look like they've got, you know, carrying around a barrel. Um, last year we were part of a NS USDA study. So all the goats got blood tests and we found out they were pregnant, but mostly we've had, you know, a lot of luck with this. God is willing with, you know, I think 90% of the time our goats have gotten pregnant. We bring in a buck, we leave them here for at least five weeks through a heat cycle, and um, and it happens for most of them most of the time. Most goats, when they're kidding for the first year, like Miss Laura here, most mostly they have a single kid the first year, and after that they're generally having twins and sometimes triplets, and. Often they do that. Most of the time they do all that by themselves. Sometimes when we're not even here and we don't even see it, we come in in the morning and boom, there's kids or we were here, you know, visiting with the goats, no kids. And we walk away for half an hour, we come back and there's kids born. And sometimes we have helped um, in various ways. And sometimes we've had to call the vet. So over the last 18 years, all kinds of things have happened, but mostly they can kid without, um, without assistance. Can you show more of the goats, please? Down, <laughs> down below. <laughs> we, they want to see the goats. So what are they doing right now? They're just eating hay. Can you? They're eating hay. This is their hay feeder. And every day we, we bring in hay. Hay is just dried grass that we get from a nearby farm. And, and yeah, that's what they're doing. And the white goat over there is chewing her cud, which means she is 
uh, how do you say this nicely? Regurgitated some <laughs> of the half digested hay into her mouth and is chewing on it a second time. Again, this is rough stuff. It takes a lot of work to turn it into food. Yes, they are totally vegetarians. I'm glad that no one asked if they eat tin cans. I've never seen a goat eat anything but plant material. And yet they will sometimes get curious. And if you have a scarf hanging down um, or string hanging off your gloves or whatever, they will put it in their mouths and people say, oh, she's eating my glove, but they're not actually eating the glove. They're just tasting it, just putting it in their mouth because that's their, one of their ways of experiencing the world. Um, but they, yes, they are entirely herbivores. They are vegetarians. Awesome. Everyone's loving the, the goat content. Thank you so much. We still have a little less, we have a little less than 15 minutes. So if anyone has any follow-up questions or anything about goats specifically or the work that Shamu and myself and others are involved with it, Isabella Friedman, feel free to feel free to keep dropping them in the chat. Otherwise we'll just uh, take watch the we'll do some goat video. <laughs> Oh, Carol Mann, do goats sleep lying down? Yes, they lie down. Yeah, they kind of cuddle up, curl up a little, lie down, maybe leaning against. You can see all the marks against this wall from goats just kind of, you know, cuddling up against it. Um, there's a question about considered setting up a goat cam live stream. Um, the Jackson who asked that question, in the beginning of the pandemic, we actually offered as a um, we offered goats to join your Zoom calls, um, <laughs> which was a little fun project we did at Isabella Friedman to help kind of promote and, and help us during a hard time and also bring some cuteness to your otherwise maybe monotonous Zoom calls. Um, uh, let's, let's see, we've got a bunch of questions coming in. Um, do goat how do how do goats do you think like communicate with each other um do they do they make noises like dogs will bark what do goats do that's a great question they do make some small noises i hear that a lot more between kids and the moms than i do between adult goats we essentially have all adult goats here except here are our one less than year old goat right here miss laura um but they, and they're very physical with each other, as maybe you've seen. They push each other and they sometimes headbutt. And they do generally set up a hierarchy. And certainly for milking season, the first goat that comes in is the alpha goat. Because she wanted to come in first and she, she's the alpha and she might be the first one at the hay feeder or whatever. We have plenty of room here. So it's like there's plenty of room for all the goats to be here, but they do like to set up a, a hierarchy in the herd and that happens with a bunch of uh a bunch of pushing kids and their moms there's a lot more vocalizing a lot more subtle noises and even though that we we separate the boys are our male goats generally aggressive or is it based on personality you think that's a great question um, in this day and age, you know, the men, human men have, have a lot to learn, right? We have, we're going through a big transformation, big opportunities for us in combating toxic masculinity and all that. The goat and the boy goats, no, they're not naturally aggressive, although they do have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of physical energy and they will tend to headbutt more, right? And a lot of that's just determined by, by hormones but we've had plenty of really sweet boy goats. The fact of the matter is that even in the wild with wild goats and sheep, they're generally set up in a, in a mating grouping that involves one male with many females. So it, it, there's a whole, even from the wild end of things, there's a whole different kind of behavior and aggressions and hierarchy setting set up around mating and and there's a lot yeah and there's a lot of both playful and physical aggression in those rituals and in that behavior um, and we separate them because we want to be able to determine who mates with whom right 
and when uh, when they're mating, when breeding is happening. And we want to make sure that we're bringing in new, <coughs> you know, new genes to the herd. Someone asked about, I think we need to go back to the removal of the girl's horns. Um, they asked what you do with the horns when you take them off, but I don't think they're big enough. I'm not sure. We've made some shofars. Yes, we oh. have made shofars before, for sure. Lots of Ottomanics have taken home horns and, and, and we've made some shofars. Hard to get the aperture just right, but with a drill and a saw and some sanding, you can you can make it work. Yeah. I think the question wasn't for the goats we chef, but for the girl goats when you take off their horns oh, when they're babies. No. There's nothing. I mean, there's nothing like, there, right, right? It's a it's the it's an incipient, tiny little quarter inch growth um, that we burn off with heat. Mm -hmm. Which yes, it's not fun to do, but it only lasts a couple, you know, thirty seconds or so. And we find that it makes for a safer and healthier goat life. Um, can you just actually, a definition of what a shofar is? Someone in the chat was asking. Oh, uh, a shofar is, well, traditionally a ram, a male sheep's horn that has been um, made so that you can play it, so that you can and it's been used since ancient times among Jews as a way to gather and as a spiritual tool to bring us into awakeness and as a tool to proclaim freedom in the land. So that's a whole fun ancient Jewish ritual tool. Um, someone asked how long it takes a goats to get to adulthood and um, good question what adulthood is. I right. mean, I've got a 17 year old son. <laughs> adulthood, almost, I don't know, 22, 25. Um, no, uh, seriously, we don't, let's say a year. Let's say a year. I mean, you saw the size of our smallest, yeah, here she is, of our smallest, and she is. She was born in nine April. months old, right? Mm -hmm. She's nine months old. Miss Laura is. Uh, oh, sorry, Miss Laura is the youngest one. Blue is um, a year and a half old, a little more than a year and a half old, and. She'll get a little larger, but she's already was large enough to breed, mm -hmm. right? And my guess is that she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. So we let ours go a year and a half before we breed them. And can you actually talk about the breeding process? We don't, we just talk about the buck and how that all works. Sure. Um, so we're, we're not we bring, in, in we bring in a buck who's not related genetically family-wise to any of these goats and who has a history of, of, of uh, fathering healthy young, means he has good genes. And he comes in here and he senses when they're in heat, when the females are in heat and he mounts them and, you know, inseminates them and hopefully they get pregnant. It doesn't happen every time. Right, because we're here to clarify, we're not inseminating them or or nope. or, or forcing nope, that natural, process. Natural right, right. Process. Right. Yep. I forgot all the euphemisms for that. What we call that, <laughs> but yes. And and what's the what's the gestation period? Five months. Right, you said that earlier. Yeah. Five months. So um, the buck was here early December. They could have gotten bred anywhere in a five, six week period. Then we kept them longer because the two white goats came. So it's, you know, we don't know exactly when they got pregnant, but, you know, count mid December, or late December, five, you know, five months. Mm -hmm. So May ish. 
Um, so we have five more minutes. Um, just want to thank Shamu for this awesome presentation. I hope everybody. I Oh, sorry. Go, no, I just hope everybody found it as I work at Isabella Friedman with Shamu and I still love these goat sessions. So um, thank you, Shamu. And thanks to Yona for the camera. Yes, work. thanks for Superman, Yona Sadev, JYCM. And I hope the goats all, uh, but, you know, opportunities for us to appreciate where food comes from and how other creatures live and make us think about exactly what we eat and how we treat the more than human life around us and make us stretch in our commitments to do something good in the world. That's right. Um, stay tuned. I just put my email in the chat. If any, a lot of people had specific questions for Isabella Friedman, feel free to reach out to me directly. You can also find my email address on the Chazon website. Same with Shamu. We're always open and eager to answer any questions that you might have and look, look, uh, stay tuned for our programming that we'll be doing for 2021. Um, you can get our newsletter or check our, check our website for updates. Um, any last questions? I could take two more. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna keep this meeting open for another two minutes, but thanks for everyone for joining. Shalom Aleichem. Peace be with you. Be well, everyone. <laughs> Happy Climate Fest. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. That Shalom. was fascinating. Yay. Thanks, everyone. Really, really interesting. Yeah, now we'll do some goat cam for a minute. We have two minutes left, so we could just stare at these beautiful, cute goats. <laughs> what, what time do you have to wake up in the morning to start all of your goats? Oh, they, they wake up pretty early. Seven-ish. Seven. Well, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah. That's my dogs wake up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look at these cuties. I will say I, I am not part of the Adama team, although I work at Isabella Freeman, but I have helped deliver a goat before and it was just utter bliss. It really was amazing. Utter. I like the oh. <laughs> Thanks for thanks for that. Yes, utter bliss. It was really wonderful. So they're so cute. Yeah, they are. Oh, the bus. Quick thing about the bus. Shamu, you want to do a quick minute about uh, the, the bus, bus and what it is? The bus was a yeah. uh, tool of the Teva Learning Center, which is an amazing environmental education program that happens here at Isabel Friedman. And the bus ran off used vegetable oil. Um, and we used it as a, as a teaching vehicle. It toured across the country two and a half times with a group of wonderful Jewish educators, Jewish environmental educators who talked about energy and solar energy and waste energy and composting and growing your own food and everything that is dear to us. And uh, if anyone wants to give us a whole lot of money, we'll fix it up. <laughs> <laughs> but if you live in Detroit, there is a partner yes. to the, there is a twin and we deliver our CSA food with Chazon Detroit. Um, on that bus. So if you live in Detroit, you can go see one that's operational. That one is retired for the moment. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much.